I'm going on an adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. Is this going to be the archaeological trial of the century? I think so, yes. The world is watching. It should. Basically, the overall picture is, is what, if you could just explain. It, there's a, a factory, a ring, uh, forging antiquities and selling them into the marketplace. Like, what exactly is going on? Exactly that, a ring of uh, people who forge systematically antiquities and market them in Israel and abroad, selling them to uh, private collectors, uh, galleries, museums, all around the world. And what kind of monies are we talking about? We're talking about millions, millions of dollars. And actually, it's not only the money that concerns us here. It's the um, contamination of archaeology as a science. And forgery not only of the artifacts, but forgery of history. And that's, uh, that's serious. How serious? A forged object can change history. Imagine if someone claimed to find the tomb of Moses in Jordan, or the bones of Jesus anywhere. Such direct contact with the past might reshape our present and our future. But spotting the forger's hand has never been easy. You see, archaeology reads stones. And sometimes archaeologists can't agree what the stones are saying. And I can't see any difference between the big and the other. That's the case with the James Ossuary. An ossuary is a stone bone box used at the time of Jesus. And the side of this one says, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. When it surfaced in 2002, some scholars declared this to be the greatest archaeological find of the last century, the first real physical evidence of a man named Jesus. But other scholars say, It's done beautifully if it's forged, it's by a genius. If it is a forgery, this is the man accused of being that genius. Oded Golan, owner of over 3,500 pieces of biblical archaeology, one of the world's largest private collections. His passion for collecting started early. Well, I began to collect antiquities at the age of eight. In later years, at the age of 10, for example, I found in Mount Hatzor, in Tel Hatzor, the oldest di dictionary ever found in the world. Um, at that time, I didn't recognize, of course, that it, this is the most important uh, uh, inscription found until that time in northern Israel. In later years, I traveled a lot to the old city of Jerusalem, and I used to buy antiquities already at that time. And one of the items that I purchased in the early 70s was this ossuary. This inscription is one of the more important inscriptions that I have in my own collection. But that inscription just might cost Oded Golan everything. It might be possible, it may be possible, yeah. He's about to go on trial for antiquities forgery. Here are the most serious charges. One, forging a number of ancient objects, stone lamps, royal seals, and inscriptions. Two, forging the Yoash stone, an ancient tablet supporting Jewish claims that Solomon's temple once stood on the Temple Mount. Three, the charge grabbing the most headlines forging the James Ossuary inscription, thus affecting the history of Jews and Christians around the world. But if the inscription turns out to be real, it'll be the first physical evidence of Jesus of Nazareth. 
Now, Oded was indicted as the master forger of the last century. Not of all time, just the last century. You see, about a hundred years ago, a gentleman walked out of the desert. He swindled kings, queens, press, and public. And he didn't just forge one or two objects, he faked an entire culture. Archaeology studies the past to illuminate the present. To understand today's charges against Golan, we need to dig into the history of biblical archaeology. People have hunted Holy Land souvenirs ever since the 4th century, when Saint Helena claimed to have found bits of the true cross. That was the birth of biblical relics, a sort of proto-archaeology, the start of collectors and dealers of supply and demand. A thousand years later, medieval forgers did a healthy trade in relics like St. Isidore's hip bone, St. Hyacinth's toenails. Real biblical archaeology, what we recognize as a science-based biblical archaeology, starts in 1868. This happened when a French team discovered the Mesha Stella. Hello, all you people out there in Gameland. Today, we're going to play an exciting new game called Real or Fake. Can you spot the fake? Stella is either A. An ancient stone tablet with inscriptions describing victories of kings. Stella. Or B. Marlon Brando's most famous line from a streetcar named Desire. Stella! The Mesha Stella describes battles between ancient Israelites and Moabites. It was amazing, the first external source corroborating a biblical tale. The Stella's discovery inspired one of the world's great swindlers, Moses Shapira. Yerit Salmon is a curator at Jerusalem's Tico House, a museum dedicated to Shapira. Shapira decided to open a shop of antiquity in the old city. Oh, yeah. so he opened it when all this excitement on the Mesha Stella. Yes. He said, oh, there's a business here. Yeah. People like old rocks. Yeah, and he opened the shop in the uh, Christian quarter. But when he opened the shop, business didn't go immediately so good. And then an Arab uh, tourist guide came to him and said, if you want to have tourists, make a business with me. And what is the business? Everything which we are missing, we can do during the night. And so a big antiquity forgery started, and every day, every morning, whatever he needed was ready. So they, they set up a factory at yes. night for the creation of antiquity. Yes. If you think about it, it's the ideal shop. You can go and order whatever antiquity you want, mm -hmm. and they make it to order. His forging methods were simple, but they worked. Shapira used to put the, the pottery in, in salt and also the parchment. He put it in salt. To make it look old? Yes. You okay, I them. could see that it's a fake in a minute. For these are very... Today, yes. These breasts too. are not yeah. very convincing. And the penis, it shouldn't have the testicles. That, that's a giveaway. <laughs> Ancient times... Nothing like that was found. No, they're just wrong. <laughs> it might look wrong to us now, but 150 years ago, biblical archaeology was in its infancy. No one knew what it should look like. The sexual nature of Shapira's fakes underscores a basic law of forgery. Give the people what they want, and sex sells. Symbols, but here well, What's really? sexual of that? I don't know. What's that? Maybe you say, you tell oh. me. I don't know, but... Oh, but that looks used, like a leg. Yeah, kind of. He, he, he used everything. I mean, he tricked all these archaeologists, right? Yes, he did. They chose they don't know. And they believed in it. And they believed in it. At that time, they really believed in it. Maybe then they called everything real, and now they call everything fake. Yes, sometimes, yes. Shapira copied bits of the Stella's ancient Moabite text onto pottery. He then sold the forgeries as authentic Moabite artifacts to a host of clients, including the German Kaiser. He produced so many of these fakes that, 
If I understand you correctly, they created an entire Moabite culture. Yeah, exactly. Real or fake? Can you spot the fake? A Moabite is either a... A biblical tribe descended from Moab, the son of Lot. Moabite. Or B... Gangsta rap slang for large jaw. Moabite. They bought from Shapira 1,700 pieces of um, Moabitic clay, ceramic. 1,700. They exhibited in the Berlin Museum. Fake stuff. Fake stuff. No one knew what a Moabite should look like. So Shapira played to his audience. He was selling to the Kaiser. So? I have to say, he made the ancient Moabites look German. <laughs> he gave them a German mustache. Yeah, yeah, look at that. They look nice. downright Prussian. Yeah. And he sold them 1,700 pieces. These guys, no wonder these guys loved it. They no, said, no, look, the no, ancient Moabites look just sorry, like us. From, nice. this, from this, I don't know how many sold. But isn't it brilliant to, if you're going to fake it, to make it look, the ancient stuff, look like the guys you're going to sell it to? Maybe. I'm not so Look sure. at that. He gave them Prussian mustaches. I'm surprised he didn't have a little helmet with him. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this stuff. Shapira's scam seems incredible in hindsight. But remember, in Shapira's day, biblical archaeology was new. No one knew what the real thing should look like. But how do we spot a fake today? And I don't care if it was made yesterday, I believe it. Well, you have to learn the forger's secrets. Fierce debate surrounds the James Ossuary. Did Oded Golan try to change history with a daring fake? The academics can't agree, and the cops have been called in. I think it's time for a lesson in spotting a fake. Jerusalem antiquities dealer Gil Chaya has spotted a few. One of the best fakers in Israel is an Arab that lives near Naples. Uh, this is a Samaritan oil lamp with a menorah over here. Now, ah, very, that menorah looks suspicious to me. We have very little uh, artifacts with menorahs, so they're worth a lot of money. An oil lamp like this, if it was real, would be $10,000. 10, ten, now, ten, ten grand? $10,000. Now, why is it fake? How can you tell the menorah is fake? The oil lamp is good. It's an original oil lamp. Really? Yeah. There's the menorah, which is the uh, seven branch, seven candelabra. branch candelabra. Yeah. And uh, Gil says, this is real. Is this stuff real? Yeah, the whole oil lamp is Everything real. Everything is real. This stuff has been added. They're, so they're how nice. do you know that? First of all, if you look, look at it from the side, it's always curved like this, OK? Now, if you look at it over here, over here it's curved. It's convex instead of being concave, which means that this was concave also, but he carved down, he carved around the menorah, you understand? Yeah, here this is an original one, yeah. for example, and you see it's, it's concave oh, see, everywhere. This one, here it is, it's up, concave, right? This one, there's a little dip in there. Convex, yeah. Like that? Good, bad, see? This one bumps down, and the point is somebody carved it down. It would fool me, boy. It, it would fool me. So this is going for $400. It goes for anything from two to $400. You put a menorah on it, suddenly it's worth 10 grand. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody tried to sell it to you? Yeah. And you yeah. said, I'm no sucker? You know, the second you look at something, I can tell it's fake already. Right. You get a feel for it. As soon as the James Ossuary was shown to the world, some said it was real, some said fake. Critics said it was unusual, different from other ossuaries. 
For instance, almost no other ossuary says brother of. That made it an anomaly. Ed Keel was one of the first to study it. He was a curator at Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum when the ossuary made its debut to the world in 2002. I went back to check in with Keel. He says academics can't agree whether an anomaly makes or breaks an artifact. Even a banana split can split the academics. This is a fake one? I think, yes, yeah, probably is. You're not sure? This purports to be something like 5th century AD from Iran. Silver. It's a nice banana split uh, bowl. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's the kind of thing that, yeah, princes and, you know, princesses would have and, uh, and probably eat fruit or something like from it. And then there are various designs on it. If you took individually, took one of those elements like this, you know, stalk creature or a leopard or a palm tree, each one of those in isolation, you could go to a catalog or, you know, at a museum collection and say, oh, look, it's exactly like that. But the problem is it's the combination which is weird. And that's, a, that's what they've done. They've, they've used the catalog of the collection that's a legitimate collection as a pattern book. But how do we know that? Well, like how do we know there wasn't one guy in ancient times who decided to put it all together? Well, they, yes, indeed, that, that's a problem. The funny thing is that the profession falls into two groups of people. There's the one group, when an object appears, they go to the known catalogs and they look down for exactly a, a, a parallel for it. And, and they say, OK, there it is. There's the parallel. It's genuine. There's the other school, which is what I fall into, say, yeah, but the forger has those catalogs too. And I look for something that's totally weird and accept it more readily. But that other group looks at something weird and says there's no parallel for it. It must be false. I see. That's very so, interesting. So yeah. the very eccentricity will the, lead one to say, this must yeah, be forger, real. A forger usually copies something that is known. Using that yardstick, the James for you would be real. Yeah, because it's, because it's weird. Because you, there aren't, the very fact that there aren't 150 other exact versions of it. But that means that two different academics, two different diagnoses. Within this institution, there are, we have fierce arguments over whether, and it this occurs piece? over this piece. I'm wanting to put it out on display, and somebody else saying, oh, I don't really think that it's real, and then you, you argue over it. The argument against Odet Golan and the James Ossuary is led by the Israel Antiquities Authority, or IAA. They police Israel's antiquities market, a market where objects are guilty until proven innocent. IAA investigated Odet Golan and the James Ossuary. The scientific charges against the Ossuary are technical, but easy to understand. One, patina, a crust that builds up on stone over the years, just like rust on metal, but patina is on stone. If the patina is new, it means the Ossuary is fake. Scholars can't agree on how old some of the James Ossuary patina is. Two, epigraphy the study of handwriting in ancient cultures. Scholars can't agree if one or two hands carved the ossuary's inscription. I think it's nonsense. It's, it's I agree, hand, I whether, agree with it. Whether, for, whether forged or authentic, it is one hand. Some say the all-important brother of Jesus was carved by a second hand, added at a later date, and so a fake. The IAA leads the charge against Golan, they established a special scientific committee to study the ossuary. The IAA declared and decreed the ossuary was a fake. Amir Ganor is a gun-toting archaeologist. He works for the IAA. He investigated the James ossuary, which came from Odet Golan's private collection. Ganor is suspicious of private collections. Here's the problem. Artifacts in the market often have shady backgrounds. 
because profit drives the market. And where there's profit, there are thieves and forgers. כעיקרון, אספנות עתיקות בכל העולם זה דבר שמעודד שוד עתיקות, וצריך להגיד את זה בצורה מפורשת. The IAA classes dealers with robbers. Why? Well, the law governing dealers is a bit of a contradiction. First, how do dealers get their merchandise? How did it get here? From a legal dig? I doubt it. Probably some uh, Palestinians who were out of work, ran around the hillside, found tombs, took the stuff out. The Israel Antiquities authorities chased them, and if they, if they got caught right here, if they caught, got caught outside, they went to jail. But if they made it through those magic doors, that's a legal, authorized antiquities dealer. Once they made it, ah, I made it, it's legal, it's kosher, you can sell it. Now that's very frustrating for the Israel Antiquities Authority. And the IAA likes to share its frustration with the police. Aren't you frustrated if you chase some kid down, you know, and catch him, then uh, you got him, and if he, he gets it into the shop and, and sells it and comes out, he goes to you, and, and then you can't touch him. Maybe the artifacts are sold, and from that point and on, they're kosher, but the person will be after him in a minute. Also, you can put him in jail, and the dealer who's selling his stuff is okay. Strange, no? Strange, but, uh, but true. true. <laughs> <laughs> Strange, but true. Yeah, well. Well, I think that the Israeli Antiquity Authority uh, feels some embarrassment. Uh, and uh, I cannot blame them, uh, by the way, because uh, the law in Israel is quite a ridiculous law. On one hand, all the dealers are working under license. Uh, while the Israel Antiquity Authority knows for sure that the majority of the items which are sold officially under license, under supervision, are coming from illegal excavations. Yeah, that's the catch-22 of the law, which is actually a good catch. Uh, if you're a, a digger, you know, it's not good to dig, obviously, but if it's already dug out, and because people will always dig, uh, once it's out, then it may as well stay out in the public eye than to be smuggled out secretly outside of Israel. So, uh, actually, it's a good law. It's a very good law. Good or bad, it's a tough law to make work. Tough for the cops, tough for the IAA, tough for the dealers. But is it so tough that Golan is destined to go to jail? Okay, we shall talk about this later. Okay. Is the James Ossuary the greatest archaeological find of the last century, or the greatest fake in the history of biblical archaeology? <laughs> Tune in next time and find out on The Naked Archaeologist. Thank you.